Yeah, pop on. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the United Rugby Rewind with me, Lee G. And joining me as always is the happy crew of Kaylin, Alan and Ben. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, Lee. How are you? And we we have to say again that we're recording on a Friday again because some of us have got Tupperware parties to go to or a makeup party of some sort on on Sunday night. So imagine we... imagine having a social life <laughs> would never be the rest <laughs> of us. <laughs> what is a social life? <laughs> I, th- I think this is once you get to a certain age, just sitting down and talking with other blokes about rugby. That's that's kind of your social life. And you kind of like, can can you turn the music down? And can we close the door because it's a bit drafty? And can everybody just hush for a second because I want to listen to what my pal's got to say about. And I I don't get kids today, anyway. So our social evening for tonight, our social get together. Um, we, we're gonna kick off. Let's like say it's Friday night, so we are gonna talk about New Zealand and South Africa. But before we get into that. We just, some news broke tonight that just took everybody sideways. My phone literally exploded. Um, I was cooking tea and I'd left my phone on top of the toaster because it was the only place that was available. And then it starts like vibrating when like your messages go off and it was like the phone was ringing. It was buzz, 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 announced that he will be leaving the Ospreys at the end of this season. He's going to be replaced by... Uh, so, Tiprick is going to move... Uh, this is Tiprick's last season, so he's going to move to defence coach. And then... Shit, I've forgotten his name. He's going to, uh, Mark Jones. Uh, Mark Jones. Jones, that's the boy. I knew I'd forget something. So, Mark Jones is going to step up and take over as head coach. So... What do you guys make on the, the the timing of it and the announcement and all of that kind of stuff? It's, it's, I'll throw it open to you guys first. I, I think we mentioned it before we hit record. There's no right time. There's no right time. There's no wrong time. Like I know with with the team like the Ospreys, you could say, well, you know, like their season, they could finish anywhere between, say, 6th and 14th. I think we discussed that two weeks ago. We recorded the Welsh one. Probably not 14th, but you know what I mean. And like if if they have a bad season, oh it's the coaching announcement. If they have a good season, oh good thing they did it early and got it out of the way. Reality is like the the, the players probably know this for weeks. It's not this week that they found out that never happens. They've probably known for weeks. And I think in some ways I do admire Toby Booth for doing it this way because like we know the way it is with sports. Sport is cutthroat. You could lose your job in the morning in as we've seen with the likes of like London Irish and Worcester and Wasps and in that end, but also coaches being let go as well. And my initial reaction was this is a big loss for the Ospreys because I, I, I don't know. And maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know if they can build the same type of project without him. I think he's been integral to it. The buy-in of the players, the buy-in of the supporters, the patience from the supporters at the start as well. He's an, a wonderful personality, a wonderful character. And that's infectious. That doesn't rub off very easily. He will leave a presence around that that place. And listen, the best thing you can ever say about a coach is they've left the job in a better place than how they found it. And he absolutely has. And I think he's going to be a lost league. It'd be interesting to see where he goes or if he goes anywhere at all. As I said, I would love to see him as, well, I'd love to see him as a Welsh coach from a rugby pundit point of view. Maybe not as a as an Irish fan because I think he'd he'd make them be better, but I would I'd love to see, I'd love to see him with a with a big job and I think he could do great things. I think he's a fine coach, gets great player buy in, knows how to win rugby matches, which is important, and I wish him the best of luck as I'm sure many people will this evening because I I haven't seen a bad word about him. No, no. Alan, Ben, any any, any thoughts? I mean, I think uh, these things, I, I kind of agree uh, with Kaylin. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's the beginning of the season. The players are probably all at the announcement, like you said, so I agree in that regard. Um, I think he's probably, you know, he's probably assessed the situation at the club. They're in the best place in the Welsh, like, shield. 
they had a pretty good finish. They got to the you know the knockout stages of the URC, and I think with Tipperick replacing him, it's going to maintain a specific culture, which is very important. Something we could probably all agree they probably have the the best at uh, at that club is the, probably the culture. So I mean, it is a big loss, but these things happen, and um, they've got you know we don't know how Tipperick will handle going into the role, but he's a player. He has a lot of respect from the team and obviously the uh, organisation. So that should be all right. I think they've got everything in, in place. Um, they've got a new ground coming up. Um, so they, they've got the systems and structures in place to, to, to like not have, it's not going to impact them like too much if they plan it right, which, look, which they probably have. So I'll just correct you on, on that. It's Mark Jones going as head coach and Tipperick going as defence coach. But the comments right. remain. Having okay. Tipperick as part of the coaching team still makes the uh, still makes it all spot on. So, uh, Ben? Not much more to add, really. I think, you know, all I would say is that if that, when he when when obviously leaves Ospreys at the end of the season, is if they continue to move in the right direction, it shows that he's left a legacy behind that's been inherited by Tipperidge and Jones, and if they continue forward to that, that just shows that what he did has has been remarkable over was it four years he was there to go from yeah. where they were to where they are now. It's impressive, and you know maybe it's the case he takes a sabbatical, does a Jurgen Klopp, and maybe comes back when he gets a bit, you know, a bit itchy again to get back at the helm or something. But I think he's left. You know, it's an impressive mark on his CV to to then potentially go anywhere with it. Really, I think, but a well deserved break might be in his interests, and then he comes back. <laughs> When the mm. right role appears, he'll be the kind of type of person who doesn't need to jump into the next level job. He'll be able to pick a job, I think, because of his reputation in the game. Yeah, and I think the the, the thing with him is, is he's he has been around a while. He talks a lot in his uh, video about uh, elite sport and different challenges and and things like that. So yeah, you're right. You, there aren't many people that get to pick and choose the the retirement date, if you like, um, or the leaving date. So for him to go, yeah, you know, and, and he's in no kind of major rush to make a decision. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him turn up as kind of, um, he, he's very good on the mental side of it. When we talk about building culture, you talk about, you know, what he says is, is, is quite clever because he tells you what he wants you to think about his team. You, you know, my team are playing uh, exciting, interesting rugby. You know, they, they just scored six tries off the back of a driving line out but when you you listen to the conversations in Osprey's land and it's this is exciting rugby this is interesting rugby so he's really really good at how he controls the environment around him and how he he projects that out so I would well, lead, not... leaders set narratives don't they and he's yeah. a leader I think yeah, that's exactly, exactly yeah. what you do yeah, yeah exactly yeah, set culture and dictate the culture and... yeah and that's, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him turning up uh, um, in athletics, in uh, you know Olympic preparations or something like that, or football. Yeah, you know, it's been done in the past. Remember when um, the, Clive Woodward went to Southampton? Yeah, he went to Southampton, and, wouldn't it? Yeah, he went to Southampton. Didn't exactly work out, but it was his no. sort of attempt to go into football management. But he ended up in a consultancy role. Consultancy yeah. role with I think it was when Rupert Lowe was the chairman of South. And less said about him, the better, because he's a reform mm. MP now for. <laughs> Yarmouth off the top of my head or somewhere in somewhere in South East Essex. But um yeah, I think that was sort of a, a bit of an experiment that didn't really go to plan. Mm. And obviously he's never really coached since he's became a, a sort of average pundit, I would say. I don't really enjoy listening to him, but yeah. No, but it shows that it can be done. It shows yeah. that people do that. And so um, that's yeah. why you're never too far away from a politics conversation. Even <laughs> as we talk rugby, we managed to get reform. Yeah, it is far away. away. <laughs> reform have been mentioned before some so politics is my second at a URC yeah. podcast. How do we yeah. manage this? All right, let's move on swiftly to New Zealand and South Africa, or South Africa and New Zealand. So our predictions last week were not that far. We all predicted a South African win. Um, we weren't that far away on the points difference, but I don't think any of us predicted 31-27 or anything near 31-27. Um, so, Alan, what did you... I'm, I'm going to assume, purely from the WhatsApp group, that you watched every second of that game in, in, in like about an inch from the screen by the feel of it. Yeah, I mean, I, did, I, watched, I replayed it afterwards as well. And um, awesome game. Awesome game. Um, really thrilled with the win. Uh, pretty happy with the way we went about it. Um, but as I mentioned before we started, it's only uh, 
half the battle. We need to go ahead and win the war now and see if we can get them in Cape Town, which I believe will be a tougher game for the Springboks. The All Blacks have got a really good record in Cape Town, but I'm really obviously thrilled with the victory. Um, uh, but the, and the way they went about it, and a little bit of fortune uh, went our way as well. So that's just something you have to, I'm sure we can all think at times that the All Blacks have had fortune in their favour as well. So you have to roll with the dice, don't you? Well, I'm I'm going to ask Ben about that in a minute. But what what do you make of the lineups for this weekend? And give me a quick prediction as well for for this weekend. Um, I believe he's picked a team which has controlled the game a bit better. Cape Town's not going to be quite as free flowing, so I think it's a good idea to bring Pollard in. Um, I think even it's a bit coming into the pack is the only change. So uh, I think the pack could be a little bit fatigued. It's really tough to get up mentally after a game like that. So I'd like to say South Africa are going to win um, with Villarreal there as well. Um, obviously more of a control, a little bit less pace. Um, but I have a feeling that the All Blacks are going to shade it. And I'm going to go for about, let's say, something along the lines of 21, 19 or something along those lines. Oof, man, cut your passport up now because nobody's going to let you back into South Africa. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong. Obviously, obviously, I hope I'm wrong. I just know that in the past, that's the way the thing, the way these things roll, especially with when it gets to the All Blacks. The All Blacks are going to be absolutely amped. They've got a whole bunch of changes coming in. Guys who've never played in South Africa have a game under their belts now, and they're going to want to make a point. And South Africans are notoriously cautious when it comes to the All Blacks. So I do believe it's going to be a close game. And obviously the heart says South Africa are going to win, but I've watched enough of these games and experienced enough of them to have my doubts. But hopefully we will win it. Okay. So, Ben, talk talk to me about fine margins and the role of the TMO uh, in tri-scoring situations. Happy to. Um, <laughs> I was watching this at the pub with a couple of mates last Saturday and... Instantly, I was like, that's got to be reviewed by the TMO. I'm, I'm referring to Bongi and Manambi's try. There was such a lack of control with the grounding that I was amazed that it wasn't checked. And when I saw um, uh, Sa- Sasha go back to take the conversion, I was just a bit like, hang on, this is going to have to be stopped at this point because there were so many replays between, obviously, him walking back to set up the conversion and it being taken, but there wasn't. And I just didn't understand it. I know the separation rule has changed. In that is if there's no clear separation, then the try must be awarded. And I understand that. And it was a bit difficult to interpret at first because it was often quite odd because the ball could roll up your arm. And as long as there was no obvious separation, you can actually score the try anyway up to just below your shoulder, I think now. It's, 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 it's like as long as it goes backwards, of course. Um, but it was it didn't, it didn't, it, it denied those things. It looked like he'd lost control, it looked like he dropped it, and it looked like he dropped it before it was on the line. So I was really surprised it wasn't checked and it should have been checked. A game of that magnitude. It was a four-point difference. I know the All Blacks were ahead for you know most of the second half until Grant Williams scored quite late on in the second half. But I'd, and Craig Smith, I think, scored as well, didn't he, off the top of my head? But I just don't understand with a game of that that magnitude why it wasn't checked because we we check every other game. I can give you a comparison: France, Scotland, Six Nations at Murrayfield. We scored that try, but it wasn't given on the field, and the TMO, which I think was Brian McNeese, said. I can't see it being grounded, therefore I can't award the try. And that was that was the finest margin. That was so fine. This one was was pretty obvious, I thought. And I thought it has to be reviewed and it has to be chalked off for a knock-on. There, there are I circles, think. though, stating that, you know, he may have knocked the ball back, the defender, who it was a Barrett. He knocked the ball back and then it fell down off of his arm. He, his arm was the last, mm-hmm. uh, and then they grounded it. He, Bongi grounded it after that. So there are circles am- saying that as well. But that so circle he, needed to be on the pitch at the time. There needed to be that conversation between the TMO yes, and Andrew Grace. Yes, of course. Grace. And I, I, I agree 100%. Really it wasn't, yeah. yeah. If it, if it, because it, it just, you know, an extra 30 seconds to a minute, I think rugby fans understand that these things need to be checked. And, the mm-hmm. con, you know, a conference takes place between, you know, the three on-field, on-pitch on officials and the TMO. You see it for more subtle, you know, points of the game than that. And I was, that's why I was quite surprised. Um, but going on to scores, I suppose... We were talking about this earlier in the week, Al, weren't we, about the, the stadium that, you know, the, the DHL stadium is a football stadium, it's not a rugby stadium, and there's often differences with the way that pitches are structured, you know, a bit more circular, not that sort of square rectangular feel that you often associate with rugby pitches where the crowd are a bit closer in. Um, so it was quite interesting to hear your thoughts about that because I didn't really, you know, pay much attention to the, the effect that might have, but, you, you know, you really explained it very, very well. And I think 
they swung the axe on both sides, haven't they? There's a lot of changes both sides. Considering the, the result was so close in, in, in Joburg, I was very surprised to see the squads being changed so much to the extent they have. Bowden Barrett's been dropped to the bench. I thought it was quite a big one. Um, TJ Perrinar's completely out of the squad, I think, off the top of my head. I can't see him on the bench. And Cortez Retimo's in, who I think that must be his first start as an All Black, potentially, in South first, Africa. First see when, major game, anyway. Well, major game, yeah, fair enough. Um, and Will Jordan's been moved to fullback, and that's not somewhere Will Jordan has played for a, quite a period of time. And I don't think he ordinarily plays ever the Crusaders either on the top of my head. So um be interesting. Again, I think it's a toss-up between the two sides tomorrow. But I think more interestingly is that report this week that the South Africans and the News and the All Blacks are agreeing to a an eight game tour, which is akin to a Lions tour, which obviously will take place in Australia next year and looking at twenty twenty-five or twenty twenty-six. Twenty-six. Twenty twenty-six. Twenty-six. And I've just read another report today, and I don't know how, how widely shared this has been or whether you guys have read this, but there's a suggestion the rugby championship will only take place in, in odd years now. So Argentina and Australia will be left to their own devices for the for their summer in order to organise where they have a tour between themselves, which I don't think there's really the same level of gravitas that would carry as a New Zealand South African tour. Um, and obviously they would then play the four URC teams as well, or, or maybe, so, you know, Curry Cup teams as part of that sort of five game yeah. tour before they then go into the three tests. But it's interesting because it kind of came out of the blue, I think. Um, maybe they just saw the demand for the two home games and they thought we could probably build on this and generate some more revenue. So it'll be interesting to see the guys it takes and whether it's a one-off or whether it becomes a permanent fixture in the calendar. And World Rugby, you know, they might be quite keen on it as well because obviously they want to have a, a north and south calendar throughout the year with with some kind of ranking kind of attached to that, very similar to um, what happens, uh, I guess, in, in football now with the Champions League having a pool stage instead of a group stage where everyone's kind of ranked from top to bottom and, you know, the top teams kind of stay where they are and the other teams kind of go out of the competition or, or go to, a, a, you know, the tier below. So... Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that works out, but um, I think it's exciting as a one-off. I'm not sure how I feel about it as a permanent fixture because it could be at the expense of uh, Los Pumas and, uh, and the Wallabies, which I'd... it'd be interesting. They haven't said anything yet either either team, but I can't imagine they'll be particularly happy about it. Hmm. So, Colin, quickly give me a um, a prediction. Uh, I think South Africa will win by. I think they're going to win by seven. I'm going to go twenty-six nineteen this week. My man, mm. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you predicted a loss, man. <laughs> like, well done, yeah. You predicted it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. I, hope, uh, I yeah, love being wrong. I love being wrong, and people love telling me when I'm wrong. So there you I go. like, I like Vili Larue. I just think he has that, that command of the back line. We saw it when he was playing for the Bulls during the playoffs. Very, very good at that. And um, I just think South Africa will set a better tempo and won't concede as many points as they did last weekend. But I don't see it with that that back back lineup. Mm. Okay, so Caelan, what what did you make of it? What did you make of this week? I I'll start with last week. I didn't see it, so I'll move on to this week. Um, no, I like what the lad said. I think the changes are interesting for for most. You know, you know, you look the likes of Bud and Barrett not there, for instance. Pollard's back in. Um, Perinara drops out as well as as was mentioned. It's a change in the back row for New Zealand, I'm pretty sure as well, isn't there? There's no, there's a change in the in the back three as well. I think Ethan Blackout is onto the bench, isn't he? Yeah, so, which yeah. is something that, well, Hugh's not on this podcast. Hugh likes Ethan Blackadder. I don't really rate him, so I'll use this as a chance to say, told you, even though he was very good last week. <laughs> he was very good. We love him in South Africa. He's, he's completely he's... out of the squad. He's not even on the bench. Oh, is he not on oh, the bench? Yeah, he's, yeah. he's must, dropped must from the be, twenty-three. Yeah, must be carrying something. You'd assume, but. I think with New Zealand, like you can throw out the cliches, oh, it's tough to beat them twice, etc., etc., etc. I'm just not convinced that they're that there's anything that we've seen on the field that'll say, yeah, they'll definitely go and get this job done. But at the same time, South Africa weren't great for large passages last week. It's kind of the 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 vibe that people have been giving off. So I I probably still lean into South Africa at home. I just I just don't know. It's been a weird rugby championship that way. You know, like Argentina bet New Zealand to go out, you know, it's an entirely different game the following week. And obviously with Argentina and Australia being played in a, a bit of a mini monsoon. It's been a weird one. I'll go with South Africa. I'm not overly confident because as I said, I didn't see the game last week, so I can't be overly confident. But I will I'll go for it with South Africa for this one. And just on that, you know, this series thing, the South Africa New Zealand series, look. 
do whatever you need to do to make money. Fair enough. But at the same time, geez, you get sick of the constant chopping and changing and, you know, the selfishness of rugby unions at the end of the day, wouldn't you? Like, especially when it comes to New Zealand. You, like, look, you're the All Blacks. whoop de doo Like, you don't own World Rugby, but I think that's the issue with World Rugby. But that's for a, a deeper podcast. <laughs> the problem is with that talk. Eight, eight matches is a hell of a long time. It's going to be what ten weeks. You can't play unless they have midweek games and obviously take two sides. I think there them, will but... be midweek games. I think it'll be something along the lines of four or five weeks. I think there will be. Um, I don't think they'll drag it out too long because of the the, the calendar and that kind of thing. So, well, we'll 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 maybe cover that up. Did I get a, a prediction out of you, Kayla? I said South Africa just, but I'm not confident in any. You know. I've no idea. <laughs> so yes, my prediction is I don't know what the score will be. Okay, that's pretty much. That's, I'll go twenty-five twenty South Africa. Okay, okay. So um, I I was the same. I didn't see the game last week. I've seen highlights and extended highlights and, and what have you. Um, and you only get to, you you only get to see the sexy bits in the in the highlights. So it's not really the way to judge a game. But yeah, I, I mean. I'm just jealous that there's a half decent game going and, and and Wales again aren't involved. And I can't remember the last time Wales were involved in a half decent game. So yeah, fair play to your boys. Crack on, enjoy your rugby, because yeah, just irritating watching good rugby when you're not involved sometimes. So I, I'm gonna go with oh, I'm gonna go with a draw. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go with a 15 all draw. Just so people will go stop being a fanny on uh, <laughs> on social media, but uh, yeah, fifteen all is my thing. I just it's just two massive sides, and it, it is so close. Let's say it was one decision away from the game going the other way. You know, the, there are micro decisions in in each of those games that can completely turn it. And you're the two best sides in the world playing at each other, going hammer and tongs, and yeah, I just. I love the fact. Just a little that interesting side note: If New Zealand win, Ireland will go number one in the world. Yep. No. <laughs> Yay! So <laughs> exciting. It's not the okay, way you want to get so there, much. is it? Like it doesn't. I honestly. And the funny thing is, what I always find funny is, and I might end it on this: You'll always see journalists come out and say, "World Rugby have announced." It's like lads, there's a calculator on their website. If World <laughs> Rugby are announcing this then someone is getting asked to do a job they don't need to do. Otherwise, you're just saying you did it, but you're saying World Rugby said it just to make you, I don't know. It's yeah, just one just of my gripes. AI somebody. tool, isn't it? Yeah, with the point system. Yeah, yeah and... essentially. Like like every rankings, I know the like golf one is really, really weird because it goes off like 40 events, but whatever. But like this is, it's right there. It is yeah. right there on a website. You can do it yourself. If I'm under number one, I won't bring it up next week. I promise. I Thank you. It. <laughs> well, you have like journalists before like the the last day of the Six Nations going. Well, if England win by six points, they'll be in uh, number three in the world. But if Ireland win by more than four points, more than England win, they'll be th- so they know they know the night before what happens and what needs. So yeah, it's um, bizarre. Bizarre. I think there's. Fun. I think an o- overreliance on stats sometimes takes the joy out of the game, doesn't it? I think. Um... And yet here we all are know. on this podcast, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Completely <laughs> sucking the joy out of rugby. <laughs> and we Let's haven't even got onto the Irish team. We yet. haven't even got on to... So get to Leinster. Uh, on on that note, let's talk Leinster. So um, <laughs> uh, I'm talking about joy. So so uh, so I'm I'm going to do Leinster this week. And last week I spoke about the Sharks and how can you have that bigger side, how can you have that amount of players and all that kind of stuff and and be at the bottom of the table. And the same is kind of true of Leinster, only you know they're at the top, but they're still annoyed that that they're not number one, sort of thing. And you know, the record over the last couple of years is slightly easing off in terms of you know they they, they were winning everything but not quite really winning it and they were I think they have three finals on the trot that they've lost now, is it? Uh, European finals. So, you know... La Rochelle, La Rochelle to lose, yeah. Yeah. But the first team to ever lose two in a row and then obviously broke their own record. Their own record. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, do you know what I mean? It, it's 
there's such a big side, they've got such a big reputation. So to come third in the table is a massive, um, massive disappointment for them. Whereas the rest of us are going, oh, yeah, only third bastards. So, uh, you know, you and, and then you look at their squad and you just think that's, you know, brimming start to finish. And then you look at what they've got coming through in the academy. They could put an academy side out and compete with with most sides in, in the URC. Um, so, I might just jump in on that one point. If if everyone thinks that Leinster's unbelievable produ- production is unreal, it is. Don't get me mm-hmm. wrong. But the tide has turned in Irish rugby. And mm-hmm. now the gap between Leinster Academy and the rest is minute. Mm-hmm. Um, I, It was announced today as we record that Glasgow and Edinburgh combined academy will play at Ulster under-23 team. That Ulster under-23 team is probably better than a similar one for Leinster. It's 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 changed that much in recent years. And don't get me wrong, it is mm-hmm. still applicable now, but eventually it was going to happen because like they produced three of Ireland's greatest ever props in the space of 15 years in Furlong, Healy and Porter. You know, mm-hmm. Uh, one of our best ever hookers, one of our best ever second rows, or t- two, depending on. Fucker would say Scarlett's produced Tyburn just for the crack, <laughs> um, and so on. But like, this was always going to dry up at some stage. They still have unbelievable yeah. players, unbelievable money, but just one to watch out for going forward. It's probably getting a little bit thinner than it was, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Some mm. people say it is, but it's it's not. It was always going to happen at some stage. I, I agree. I also think that in the first two years of the URC, Leinster could send their second string team over to another to South Africa, and they were they were coming away with bonus point wins. They did that this year, and it didn't got work. Blown away. Yeah. They got blown away in both the games, and that just shows that the team. I mean, one of the games was against the Lions, who weren't like you know were not the top South African team, but to get pumped like by fifty points and concede bonus points like that, not come away with no points overseas. Um, it shows that the other teams are getting better and maybe not up to Leinster's level, but definitely the academy level and to the level mm. that um, second string team. So I agree 100%, getting closer for sure. It's I think happen. week- it'll happen to Munster. It'll happen to every team that has great production. You know, right. Crusaders, for example, who had a great production line for about 15 years. I, I think it'll swing back around and they'll be, they'll have an unbelievable talent pool and they'll, they'll always have something very strong, but it's just something worth keeping mm-hmm. an eye on. There's still unbelievable talents. Sam Prendergast, for example, mm-hmm. um, the two McCarthy brothers. Um, I'm trying to think. Finton going at scrum half. There's still unbelievable players there, but just slowing a little bit. Probably something to keep an eye on. Won't probably make a difference this year, but I think in the next four to five years, you'll see it take more of an effect. Mm. Who do you think is going to be their 10 this year? Because Rushburn didn't, like all do, it. Sane didn't people, do it last year. Like all sane people, I did something like this on TikTok. And as you can imagine... <laughs> that went down a storm. <laughs> it went down a storm because TikTok users are incredibly rational. No, um, <laughs> I I think Ross Byrne is their man. And I've yeah. still yet to see Anthony that said Ross Byrne isn't their man. A lot of that reason is what does Jacques Nienaber want in a 10? He wants an off ball, kick heavy, lay it off to someone else type 10. He does not need a even a Jack Rowley. Jack Rowley would be unbelievable in that Leinster backline, don't get me wrong. That's not what Jacques Nienaber has ever indicated that he wants. I think Sam Prendergast is a good player, but he's still very light. He's still very young. It'll take time for him to be a full provincial starter because you're talking Leinster it's a massive jersey you're replacing Johnny Sexton Munster mm-hmm. fans know this it's a tough jersey to fill it's like it's like the number 7 at Manchester United number 8 at Liverpool that's like that's the kind of jersey you're talking about I think with Kieran Frawley I think there's a player there but he's 26 years of age he hasn't played a consistent season at 10 since his first year at Leinster and he's shown in dribs and drabs he can do it. But there's a big difference in being an 80-minute man every week and being the 10-minute man every two or three weeks at 10. Are, yeah. Because I firmly believe there's no position in rugby. I Sorry, there's three positions mm. in rugby where minutes counts more than everything. Prop, 13, and 10. They're the mm. only ones. like You can build up, you can do whatever you want in the gym, you can do whatever you want in training, 
But minutes, 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 minutes are so important. If I was hanging my hat and I'd say Ross Byrne, but I do think there'd be a massive public outcry for it to be Sam Prendergast or Kieran Frawley. Mm. And look, there's a lot of reasons for that. They're fine players. There, some of it will be media driven. Um, some people might remember. Well, you probably don't remember, but Brian O'Driscoll once tweeted, "It was Harry Burns' time back in 2021 when Ireland had an injury crisis. Harry Byrne went on to win two more caps after that. It's hard. It's a hard yeah. gig, you know. And look, I wish I wish them all the best because of that. Because it's <laughs> going to be so tough, though. like genuinely. You're filling the mm. boots of Jonathan Sexton, Leinster's greatest ever player." Hmm. It's going to be a lot of pressure. So, I was just looking at the um, the players in. Yeah, so they got eight players that are now on senior contracts that have come from their academy, and and that's the bulk of the the input this year. That's that's the bulk of the people that have come in. And then, then we so we've got uh, is it Slavani? From Claremont, the Slimani, Stamen, and one Mr. Uh, Jordy Barrett. Who see now? I was I was gonna build up to those next. Sorry, two, and you, sorry. You're do, taken... you to, do you want to start again? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Juan, but no. So, <laughs> so I looked at a quote from Ronan Gara, uh, Ronan Agara, and he described the transfer of R.G. Snyman as a kick in the bollocks for Munster. Which um, I just thought I'd bring that up and and repeat that for you, Kaylin, because I mean it's taking the piss a bit. It's a guy that came with a lot of potential, cost a lot of money, and then um, you know didn't really deliver or spent. I mean he kept the physio table busy. Let's let's do, say that. But other than that, he didn't really do much. He spent all that time in the physio room. Why why the Leinster need to go and buy him? You know, there's a school of thought that says, does anyone really want him now? Does it? He, I mean, he's great for media. He's great for getting kids involved because he's got a bit of a character about him. But why go and spend that money to bring over a guy that's just spent the last two seasons crocked? Uh, and, and then you bring in Jordy Barrett for... Is it eight weeks, ten weeks, something like that? It's not a full-time it's, it's contract. Months, is it? Yeah, it's, January, well, it's, it's after January November. June, it? It's after the November tests officially. Right. Chances are we may not see him until the Christmas games because they have like I think it's Ulster. He could play against Ulster. In fairness, on what would be the last week of the November tests, and then it's Bristol. It's a good chance he sits that one out, and they give him a rest because mm. I mean they have three international centers. But I think the I'm, I'm I'm trying to make this point, and I genuinely mean this. People might laugh if you're an Irish listener or Welsh listener or wherever. A lot of the furrow against the name and signing was, well, it was twofold. It was announced two days before Christmas and three days before Munster played Leinster, which yeah. there was a, a lot of these deals are signed off on. Every deal is signed off on by the IRFU, and there was a feeling that well. Jeez, you'd never let us do that, which is fair. Like, and rightly yeah. so. It, it's a weird time to drop it. Granted, it's a bit of, it's a massive Christmas present. Do you know? Like, <laughs> get that joke in there. But it's the sense that Leinster announced, and I can't remember who it was that stepped up the central. I think it was Dan Sheehan stepped up the central contract that week. And the very the by that night, they announced Neyman. So they take one player off the books and bring in another. And we're told in Ireland that it's win now, or sorry, it's, it's a union base, it's about the good of all four teams, whatever. But that just screams of, right, we're going to take, now Dan Sheehan deserves a central contract, don't get me wrong. We're going to take this player off your books so you can sign another guy who Munster were already told you have to get rid of one of their second rows because we have this unofficial rule that you can't have like a certain amount of NIQs. The reason that rule's unofficial is because it will break EU um, trade yeah. laws and, and employment laws it, it it's there it's not written down anywhere we just know it exists and it, it honestly I, I the more I see of Orgus name the more I wonder if he'll help, help Leinster win a Heineken Cup and that's what it's all about mm. for them mm. but it's really about the fact that well once we're told they can't have him or sorry they were told they can't have him or Jean Plain 
Mm. And then it got approved that he could go to Leinster, which for personal reasons makes sense for him. His wife is, has a job in, in Ireland. She was able to move from her Limerick-based role to a Dublin-based role. It's absolutely fine. No issues there. But certainly seemed like David Nusifora, who one of his stated aims was for two Heineken Cup wins since 2019. He's had zero. That he probably just did them a favour and said, you know what? I need this one. Because mm. if you go into work and you're not hitting your KPIs, you want to <laughs> hit them, you know? Yeah. And like, that's, I'm not saying it is definitely it, but I'd be shocked if that wasn't at least part of the factor because mm. he has left with no hiding cups in the last five years after saying he wanted them. So that was kind of my my thing. Are these players coming in? So Barrett and Steinman, are they only coming in for European games? Are, are, are they the, the, the big, you know, Essentially, you, you've got the academy development side playing the lower half of the URC, kind of the first team playing in, in the top half of the, the URC teams, and then we're going to bring on the big guns for Europe. And that's, I just think it sets a bit of a, a precedent that, you, you, I mean, you're right, they've, they've essentially won nothing for three years. I mean, so, the, the precedent has been there before. Don't get me wrong, Munster signed Doug Howlett after the 2007 World Cup, went on to win the Heineken Cup. But mm. that is 15 years ago. Seven, sorry, 17 years ago now, actually. It's a long time ago. A lot has changed in RFU policy since then. And and that's why it made me laugh. A couple of online Leinster fans who were just trying to get a rise out of you would be like, well, you signed Dale Lende and Snayman. It's like, yeah, before COVID, before the entire rugby ecosystem on this planet and every other planet that they play rugby changed you know mm. so things change from time to time I think Leinster will win a trophy this year if they don't that pressure that seems insurmountable is going to it's going to be really heavy on them if they don't win this year yeah yeah agreed agreed okay so let's let's just assume that Leinster are going to do really well but everybody hates them anyway because someone's got to hate Somebody. Can I can I ask? Does <laughs> does anyone here hate Leinster? I'm just 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 throwing it out there. <laughs> I hate the fact that they bring a second string team over and still tonk us. I mean, <laughs> we did that too. So, all right, yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's move on to yourself, Ben, um, uh, and discuss the uh, the almost tropical climbs of. Connacht with the new stadium and everything else that they've got coming this year. What are we looking for out of Connacht this year, mate? Um, they've got to travel better. It's as simple as that. Their travel last year was dreadful. Um, won three games. And that was it. Their home form was very, very good. Um, Galway somewhere I've got a huge amount of fondness for. It's a trip I went. I made a couple of seasons ago to watch Edinburgh play there. It's absolutely fantastic city. I love the city. I love the culture. I love the food. People are so friendly. The stadium's a short walk from their square. Um, really, really enjoyed my time over there. Um, I think what Connor have done this season is just apart from Josh Ione, who they signed from the Chiefs, which is an interesting yeah. signing because JJ Hanrahan is a. I think he did his ACL over the summer. So that's yeah, a good sign. The earliest, earliest hand run is back is Six Nations time. It's right. a massive chunk. Yeah, it's a long time out. And, you know, he's a he's a pretty, he's a journeyman, but he's kind of found his home at Connor, I think, and, and has played there quite well for the last two or three seasons. Caelan Blade, very good scrum half, um, very, very snipey off the back of the ruck. Always been very, very keen on him. Uh, Jack Carty, you know, another good player there. Um, very much controls the game. You know, he's you know he went past Eric Elwood a couple of years ago as a top point scorer, and he's just a, a mainstay. You know, when you think of Connor, you think of Jack Carty, um, Mac Hansen, Bandiaki. You know, two very very good players. Mac Hansen has gone for a, a rather outrageous business at the front party, the back hairstyle this year, which I think um, is a lot to be <laughs> desired. But he is a he is a maverick um, in every sense of the word. But again, another very interesting player to watch. Um, they haven't made apart from. Iani, I think they've only made a couple of other signings that come in. Adam McBurney, who played for Gloucester and Edinburgh, hasn't really kicked on. And he's getting like he's 20. I didn't realize he's 27. I thought he was younger than that. Um, he's a hooker that just hasn't really found a home yet. And he is Irish qualified. So obviously it means that Connor could pick him up without worrying about having someone out of the country in that position. Um so uh interesting times for them. Um I don't on the Aki, Mac Hansen, and and having Josh Arani at 10. Aki didn't play enough last season, I think, for Connor. I think there was a few disciplinary issues and a few 
injury but issues as well. To be fair, had. that was the the disciplinary thing internally was the season before. Just yep. just to note, but he is thirty four on a central contract. His minutes are only going to go down. I think mm-hmm. in the green economy. So, I I think like we'd see a lot of call forward at twelve in Bundy's absence. Call forward if anyone has watched him. He's a really nice player. But it's at 13 that I would have question marks. Tom Farrell has gone. Yep. Um, Tom Daly has done a bit at 13. He has gone. They have Byron Ralston and Shane Bolton and Pierce O'Connor, the new signing, formerly of Bristol. A lot of people remember him. They're probably the frontliners for 13. I would go with Bolton. The reason being, when you watch Connacht, they become a very lateral team when things aren't going well because they don't have the biggest pack. Because to get the biggest pack, you need a little bit of money, you know, and that's the reality of a bar like the Lions who book that trend. The biggest packs are usually some of the best spending teams. Connacht don't really have that oomph in midfield. They go wide. They try to get you on the edge spaces. I'd probably go with Bolton at 13 just to compress defences because he's an unbelievable character. Character, sorry, carrier. Um, There's a clip of him doing the rounds. He threw Waisea well, and Nayakalevu to the side at the weekend. Now, why say I could throw me to the side or all, or any of us, <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen in reverse. Like, Bolton's a massive carrier. I'd love to see him at 13. Now, you could talk about, oh, two big men at 13. How are you going to get out wide? Use Matt Hansen as your playmaker. He's, he does it anyway. He does it for Ireland. He does it for Connacht. They did miss him because, obviously, he didn't play a game after New Year's Day last year. This <laughs> weekend, the day after we record, we'll play like, first game back. Yeah. Um and look, they need him because Mac is one of the best players in the world. If you have one of the best players in the world, you're gonna need him. That's just the only thing I'd look out for with Connacht. Agree with your points on the signings. They have made a few, I think they've made six or seven signings in total, none of them the most high profile. Um, maybe watch out for Timmy Lasisi. There's there's a player there. I don't think he's quite found it at Leinster yet, but I think there's a player there that they could find and Oh, there's someone else as well. It's skipping my mind. Uh, David O'Connor. That's it. Brother of Alan O'Connor, the Ulster captain. He's worth keeping an eye on as well. He's big, powerful, lock six. Um, coming from Ealing, yeah. Coming over from Ealing, but he has a lot of experience with Ulster. Probably worth keeping an eye on as well. Um, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on Connacht and their season last year as well, though, because I think they'll admit it wasn't, not that it wasn't their best, but as you said, away form was poor and they faded out of the competition like from your perspective especially from an Edinburgh Lions perspective where do you rate Connacht because you're probably all grouped together in some people's eyes yeah it's 6 to 10 and I think they probably would be disappointed with 11th last season um, yeah I was surprised by them because their away form apart from a, I think a couple of short small away wins they just didn't seem to to get a decent, decent, you know, run. They just need to be in and out of structure all season. The form wasn't always there. And, yeah, I think Connors, I'm just looking at the European Challenge Cup for this season. They've actually got quite an easy pool. I think that might be their target this season, Challenge Cup. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd back them for that. Cardiff, Cheetahs themselves, Leon, Perpignan and Zebra, they should win that group, I think, quite comfortably. Um, Leon, Pat. If, if they target teams. us. Is the big but sh- sh- should they target because they're not going to I don't think I don't, think gonna, I, I, I don't know if they're going to be top 8 again this season I'm not sure um, I, I would but then the... there was a European final in Dublin two years ago they sent a scratch team over to Benetton got eliminated in the round of 16 or quarter final one or the other and ever since then I wonder how, do they care about Challenge Cup because if there was mm. ever a time to target it that was the year yeah. you know like yeah. and you do and like to be fair it's not a thing in Irish circles we never talk about the Challenge Cup. If there's two teams in it, we still wouldn't really bring it up. So maybe, maybe they won't. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. So my my question for you on um Connor and, and in particular Mac Hansen, and, and you'll see this as a bit of a trend from me through the season, is I think we have to discuss his hair. Yeah. Just awesome. Because, no, you know, no, Alan, it's not awesome. No. <laughs> he's Australian. What are you going to do? <laughs> he's, he's Irish, Alan. He's not Australian. Uh, 
His mother is from Cork. You'd never see a hairstyle like that down in Cork. No, I, I, I can't say that. I have seen many Irish people with hairstyles like that. It's, uh, but um, the moustache, the hair, awesome. Love it. You have to be watching Aussie Rules on a Friday or Saturday morning to see similar hairstyles. But those little shorts as well. There you AFL go. Cat, you know, it's more, it's more of a poltergeist vibe or something like that, to be honest. But yeah. he he creates a bit of a buzz when, when he's there. And uh, as a... You know, there, there's two sides to the rugby. There, there, there's the play in the game, and there's you know winning the points and all all of that kind of stuff. But then there's the off field stuff where you're actually just getting kids involved and just getting kids enjoying watching you. You know, and I can see him walking down you know any high street in in Ireland and people going, "Oh, look, look, there's, that's the guy with the hair." Which guy with it? The the rugby player, you know, the, the, what rugby player? Him, him with with the hair. Look, you know, it, it creates a buzz. He he gets out, and I I I think it's a ridiculous haircut, but I I love the fact he's gone and done it because it does. It just creates a buzz. It creates something to talk about, and and I love it. it is my favorite thing about let's discuss haircuts. And if Steph Evans ever actually makes it back onto the pitch this year as a scarlet, trust me, we're discussing that one as as part of of, of the, the that week. So let's um, let's move on swiftly from Connaught and haircuts, and let's discuss Ulster. So, uh, Alan, what, what what have you got on Ulster? What can we expect, and uh, where are they going this year? Well, I think uh, Ulster have had a few financial issues uh, when I looked into them, um, which seems to have dragged on and it's probably going to affect their performance this year. They've got the big man, the exciting man, Werner Koch. If you're talking about creating a buzz, that's your Mm. man. Um, 100% energy, 100% enthusiasm. Maybe he lacks a little bit of technique when he's tackling sometimes, but uh, he's a 100% man, awesome guy to have on your team. Really positive, good team player, good impact. You saw his social media, I hope, his little post on the his little Durban vibe, uh, get down to the Kingspan Stadium. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, obviously, but there's still the issues still remain. They have uh, some changes in leadership. They've um, they've obviously Stephen Kitsoff has gone back home. We know over the last couple of years they've had a few South African players play there. They don't seem to stay very long. Um, so it's not too dissimilar to the situation with uh, Munster going back a few years where they would get these players in for a little bit of a, a stint to help improve and get them over that, that, that winning hump, you know what I mean? And they just haven't managed to get there. Um, but I think it's going to be tougher for them this year based on the fact that um, they've had those changes at the top, they've got financial difficulties. And uh, obviously, they, they, they haven't really lost many players. And like Kalen said, they do have a really good academy. So a lot of the players are going to come through there. Um, they've lost Billy Burns. He's gone. Where's he gone? He's gone to... Um, That's a monster. Uh, he's gone to monster. So yeah, he's a, he's one of their talisman. He will be there for a long time. Um, so we just have to see how it goes. I mean, on the plus side, they do have the best kit out of all of the Irish teams. The jersey's amazing. <laughs> the stadium's really nice. And because of the connection with Ruan Pinar, and um, the flank from the Sharks, Kutsia, they've got a really, they're quite popular with the South Africans. They do tend to keep, they have kept a, a bit of an eye on Ulster over the last couple of years because of those two players. A, a lot of, yeah. a lot of great South Africans. The late Pedri Wannenberg was there. Johan Muller was captain. Yeah. Um, Pienaar, who you mentioned, they had Stefan Terblanche was there. Yeah. Also went to a European final with them. So may, may, maybe that's what Ulster need. More South Africans. Then they'll succeed. I'm sure the South Africans on online who will tell us more South Africans need yeah. to win more games. <laughs> the, only, the issue with why one of Irish's uh, I, at the moment, the Ireland teams are really good at bringing through Irish talent. And I think that's one of the reasons Ruan Pino left. I yeah. think he was planning to stay there, wasn't he? And they decided they wanted yeah. to bring some Irish talent through. So it's understandable. Um, so it's one of those things. But I mean, it's obviously benefited Irish rugby and they do have a very good academy. They know what they want. It's just those whether they can get over those issues. So, I mean, looking at where they ended last season, I expect them to finish a little bit lower in the table and potentially they could even miss out on a top eight spot. But um, de- depending on how are the other teams who we expect to do better perform. It'd be interesting how Aidan Morgan hits the ground because he's Irish qualified and he's come over from, from New Zealand and looking at the, the rest of flyoffs, Flannery and Humphreys, not not a huge amount of experience behind them. And I think, yeah, I think know, Flannery's it's be... injured as well. Um... Right. 
and Jack Murphy is in the first year of the academy. He's Richie's son. So the coach's son will get that cliche out of the way early. Um, <laughs> but if there's ever a compliment you can usually give to the coach's son guy, he is a very polished player. He he knows, you know, he knows the game really well. Morgan, I do agree with like Billy Burns. Billy Burns' greatest strength is his his he was uber consistent. He was always he was always available. His biggest downfall was he he was never the ten to bring you up another level. He's not going to be that for Munster because they have Jack Crowley, obviously. But he is he will be lost. He will be a loss. He's a big leader, a lot of experience, Ireland caps. Like you've had I think he's over like three hundred games of rugby at this stage in his career or something like that. Like something crazy. So he's a massive loss and in a normal world, Stephen Kitsoff would be a big loss because he's Stephen Kitsoff. They didn't get the best out of him. They got Tom O'Toole switching over to the loose head side now, which is worth watching. Doesn't go well for everyone. Does go well for some people, as we've seen with Andrew Porter. So if that goes well, they may end up with a net positive there. I think that was the biggest disappointment of last season was Kitsoff. I was really hoping to see something out of him and he just turned up and it felt like he didn't want to be there from day one. I just don't think... I you think know, it's uh, just it was, a, it was a failed. It was a failed experiment, wasn't it? He just didn't settle. I, um, I think a lot of South Africans struggle overseas. I think it was the same for Khaleesi. You've mentioned Snayman already. Kitsoff. These players. Um. Even 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 Etzebet, He went over to France, and um, they go over there, and uh, it's really really tough to come over to the UK or Europe and play your rugby. Um. You miss home. These guys are very very close to their families and where they're from. Um, and you can normally you've you've looked around the you know the rugby in Europe and stuff, and you see the South African players. Apart from the ones who are who play in England, they seem to excel. But when it comes to the the other URC teams and the French teams, they don't excel like they do for the Springboks. If you put Khaleesi in a green and gold jumper, he's a completely different player. You know, same with Archie Snayman. and these guys are pivotal players for us. And yet, when they play overseas, you think that's what you're getting. Actually, it doesn't tend to work out that way all the time. Is Khaleesi uh, definitely going back now? I think there was something this week, wasn't yeah, there? I think I think it's pretty likely after the comments that that uh, owner made. Mm. I mean, I think Khaleesi's wife was struggling. Uh, reports were saying that she was struggling with the with the kids and uh, the schooling, the French. But like Paris compared to Durban will be, you know, chalk and cheese, isn't it? They're not the same place. You know, Durban's no, got no. a beach, got to go. No. Paris is as busy as London, if not busier. Yeah. And, and he is compact, basically so. Mandela in a rugby jersey. That that Khaleesi's like the, the prodigal son. Like, honestly, the amount of respect and how popular he is in South mm. Africa, that's where they want him. And he's a massive marketing, you know, asset to have as well for the Sharks. I mean, I'm sure the Sharks, the Stormers probably can't afford him. So uh, the Sharks, it's looking increasingly likely. He'll go back, and his best friend is Ivan Etzebet as well. So they'd love to hook up again for the Sharks. Yeah. See, I hate sense. hate it when they do this. The, the, so we've done our Welsh review, and then Toby Booth announces he's leaving, and then we've done our South African view, and and, and then like Kalosi's like looking like he's going home. Come on, can people! I, can so- I please say if Irish news pops up this week, please for the love <laughs> of God, let it be Leinster. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on to the obvious. You know, the big side in Ireland, the main side, the one and only side in Ireland. Go ahead, see, <laughs> see the little smile growing. Mm-hmm. Go on, Kelly. Off, off you go, mate. There's so many one-liners I could throw out, but I, I know you want some actual analysis. Look, Munster deserved a Euro C crown two years ago, and I think. If they had shown up in that semi final, they win the URC last year. But that's going to hurt. To lose the semi final at home to Glasgow, who are a rival, we've discussed that before, that stings. But it mm-hmm. stings massively because they just didn't show. They played yep. about five, 10 minutes of rugby and they had Glasgow on skids when they did. Look, injuries were a factor last season. At one point over the Christmas period, they had 19 players out injured, 17 of them were senior players. Two of them were academy. Like if it, it takes a toll, absolutely. I think they've signed well. Billy Burns, who we've mentioned, will be a brilliant backup to Jack Crowley. You talk about what you want in a backup, experienced, available. That that'll do. You know he'll he'll do well. Tom Farrell they've signed. I think he'll replace Antoine Frisch at thirteen. A very silky player. He has played with um Bundiaki for the last six years. He'll be well able to play alongside Alex Nankovell now because very similar profile in terms of how they play. They've signed Takir Abrahams, who 
Alan would remember from his time in South Africa. Very elusive, very quick, bums on seats kind of guy. Really excited to see how he goes and hopefully he goes well. And I feel like there's another signing that I'm forgetting. Jermichael Gallon, yes, on the wing. Now, some people reckon he won't start. I think he will. I think he's a brilliant power winger option that will, like when Munster attack at their best, they've got Calvin Nash who can play infield, he can play on the wing, he can do whatever, but very powerful in contact. Munster want that. They don't have the biggest pack, especially in the front row. They want guys who can carry their own ball, can do their own workload in their one-on-ones. Kilgallen will add to that. I'm excited to see what he can bring. But the elephant in the room is it is an aging squad. There's no doubt about that. You've got two props there at 35 years of age. Niall Scanlon is over 30. Peter Mahoney, obviously a legend going into us, probably his last season. He's 30. 536, give or take. Ty Byrne, okay, Ty Byrne doesn't really seem to age, but he's in his 30s now. Connor Murray, probably in his last year as well. It's going to be a leadership change because there's a new captain. Peter Manny stood down as captain last year. Probably it'll be Ty Byrne. We assume it's going to be Ty Byrne for the year and maybe further field they give, they pass it on to Jerry Barron or someone. So there, there is that. And with that comes the pressure. After they didn't perform last year, there'll be a pressure now to get the job done, to get another title, to do better in Europe. Graham Rountree gave Munster a title in his first season, something very few coaches in any sport have done. He's also the first Munster coach not to win a home European game in a season because they drew to Bayonne and lost to Northampton. There's pre- there is pressure on Munster. If there's pressure on Leinster, there's pressure on Munster because they believe they're good enough to win the URC. I believe they're good enough to win the URC. And I think based on your reaction when I said what they said about Glasgow, the Glasgow game, I think you know as well, they are good enough. Done it before. It's just about performing now at this stage. And look, they, maybe they'll get unlucky with a couple of injuries at the wrong time again. That can happen. That can happen to any team. Um, But it's, it is it it is kind of the minimum this year for them, I think, is semi-final in the URC. May, may, I would say home semi-final, but obviously it can come down to such fine margins. Semi-final at least, and a European quarter-final at the very least. They're the bare minimum. So that's the kind of, I think that shows the rebuild is working because obviously, you know, the, the expectations have, have now soared. It was interesting, the game last season versus Glasgow, because it was, once they dominated that opening quarter, like they were camped in the Glasgow 22 and it was a, it was an intercept pass that Carl Stain then went and ran off 80 metres down there and then they just didn't really recover from that. And I think Glasgow even had a sin bin in for the final 10 minutes and once they really yeah. convert. They um, did for the... Yeah. the f- last like two minutes of the second half and then first 10 minutes because it was in and and the time of injury time of the first half yeah it was a and... swinging arm I think by Tom Jordan off the top of my head I think wasn't it or Cancelier I can't remember one of the two players but was it or um... was it one the back row I can't remember it was on the wing anyway definitely yeah it was right, on, it was right in front of the dugouts yeah and um, um, I think that... but I think that's was... where Munster's issue last year was efficiency at times mm-hmm. they, they were too popular yeah and that game was a prime example. The Ulster game that they played two weeks prior to that, they had a load of chances in the first half, didn't take it. We're down by two scores at half time, come out in the second half, they did take their chances. You know, so that's and it's a it's a massive part for every team. No team scores in the hundred percent of their twenty two visits. Don't get me wrong, you know. Although I think Ireland had a stat of like seven point something points per twenty two meter entry at one stage this year. Something crazy. But it it just doesn't happen. And it's a massive factor. The bench is is massive. It's something you'll hear me bring up a lot this season on this pod is their bench. When Munster were at their best last year, they employed a 6-2 bench with the likes of Ollie Yeager, Jim Barron, Gavin Coombs, either John Holland or Alex Kandelan, um, Connor Murray or Craig Casey. It would be Billy Burns this year as opposed to Joey Carberry. Lads who know how to see out a game. Lads who bring power against a tiring pack. I don't know if they'll do it this year but it's interesting to to keep an eye on because it worked last year and it's hard to move away from something that worked before. And I think the bit that impresses me with Munster is actually Graham Roundtree. It, it, it just, when he took over, it didn't seem like a natural progression. I know it was, it was, it was internal and all that kind of stuff, but he just didn't seem comfortable as a head coach to start with. And since then... Yeah, yeah, a little bit of a rocky start, but I've been really, really impressed with how he's 
but it's, yeah, it's an aging squad, but he's also building something. Do you know what yeah, I mean? You can is. see he's, he's got it's, some... It's the most important person, I think, in, this, in the building is Ian Costello. Some rugby nerds remember he was the attack coach at Wasps back in back when Wasps were kind of at their peak of like 2016, like that second peak. He was really, really good there. He came back to Munster just before COVID. He's essentially a director of rugby. He's not by title. He is essentially a director of rugby because he's involved with the professional team and the pathways and bringing true players. And he's very, very good at that. But where we've seen the difference is Alex Kandelan, um, Gavin Coombs, John Hodner, Jack Crowley, Craig Casey. These lads look pro-ready from their debut. This was a massive issue for Munster for years. They had lads who looked like they could be good players down the line. Very few of them were ready at 2021. Now most of them look ready. I watched Sean Adogbo tonight against Gloucester. Looks pro-ready. He's only 20 years of age playing in the back row. The same for Jack Oliver, a 20-year-old scrum half. It's a, it's a massive difference to make. And like, Credit to Rountree, he's allowed Ian Costello be promoted even since he went in, be promoted up the rank again further. He's brought in Mike Prendergast, who a lot of people thought if Mike Prendergast came back to Ireland, it would be as a head coach. So that's a big personality to bring back in. Brought back Dennis Leamy, who is a Munster legend. He doesn't mind having these big personalities in the room. And that's important too. The connection with the fan base is there. Um... I've I've had a couple of interactions with Graham one on one and and different things. He, he is a nice man. He's very he holds himself to good account like the team generally do. I don't think you know hmm. most most squads is the vast majority of them are grand lads, but he's he is building something you know. And credit to Johan, I think Johan van Graan he knew what he wanted, but Johan was more of a win now coach, and he focused on signings and developing the best of the players he had. And getting them to the level he wanted. I think Graham is bigger, slightly bigger picture, and he's got a lot of experience. In fair, like in fairness, he was with Georgia, with England, with Quinns, obviously that great Leicester team. And he he knows how to, he knows a lot about culture. Would be my how I put it. He knows a lot like that. What he did at Leicester wouldn't work now. Even his work with Georgia wouldn't work in Ireland. But clearly, there's something there that everyone seems to just get it you know and if he applied for an irish passport now i think he'd have quite a few people that would counter sign and be quite happy for him to, yeah. to be wouldn't it and that's that's I'd, not I'd often that happens <laughs> right okay that's um that's our uh our tour of ireland sorted uh gents so let's just finish as we as we have done previously with a couple of predictions about where your side is going to finish in the league. So before I do Leinster, I'm going to say this is where they're going to finish in the league, not necessarily after playoffs and all of this kind of malarkey, because that's, you know, I'm not, if I'm talking Leinster, I'm talking of the league. League is what's important. We, you know, the, the playoffs and all of that. Lovely dad, but it's the league that's important. So I, I'm actually going to say that Leinster are going to come top in the league. I, I just, think that there's there's enough in there this year there's enough kind of pissed off if to, if that's a word if it isn't I'll put it in there later but um the, yeah there's enough pissed off to to motivate them to kind of go that extra bit this year so I'm gonna go Leinster as number one in the league this year so um Ben Connaught Tenth, I think I can't see them doing top eight. I don't think there's enough de enough depth there. I love I love Galway and I love going to, as a rugby team. I love watching them play. There's something about that that part of Ireland I've got you know great affinity towards. But looking at it as objectively as I can, I can't see I can't see them getting in the top eight. There's not enough. Hansen's lovely to watch. Fantastic player. If he plays more often than he did last season, good ch chance, but not on his own. But they're going to have a pretty new stadium. You can't have a pretty new stadium and then come tenth. I mean, oh dear, uh, Alan uh, Ulster. Where where are Ulster going to finish, mate? Um, but well, Ulster finished seventh last season. Like I said in my little review thing, I think they should they should end around that eight nine spot. So there's a chance that they may just miss out based on the fact that we're 
anticipating that the, the Sharks are probably going to do a bit better and some of the teams that finished just below them. Um, but I think it's it's I think at come the end of the season they could be one of the teams that are around that eight mark um, and looking at just about qualifying potentially in the last couple of weeks needing a win here or there or a few other teams performing. So I'm going to put them down at I'm going to put them down at ninth um, and then see. But I reckon they could just scrape into the eight the like the top eight. But it'll be it'll be tough for them. I think. Oof. Can you remember a time when two Irish sides finished outside the top half of the table? I, I think I think all the teams are, are, are going to up their game this season. I think teams that underperformed will do much better. We already know the Scottish teams are doing better. The Italian teams should improve. I think as a general rule, I think most of the teams have improved. But uh, it's just the Welsh teams and the, that are going to prop the rest of the league up, I think. so. Outraged. <laughs> Outraged I am. Right, let's move on to Munster quickly, <laughs> Galen. Um, I I I just do the four because I'm Irish. I think Leinster first. I think Munster second. I think. No To way. be fair. <laughs> no, 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 hang on now, hang on. I think the 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 reason I still see them in top is, again, there's not a huge pile of change in the two, and I don't see. A massive change. I still have the same top three. I have Munster, Leinster, and Bulls as the same top three as last year. Actually, I went Stormers third and Bulls fourth, but yeah, same, close enough. I'm going to disagree with Alan. I'm going to go with Ulster fifth. I really like this Ulster team and the way they're growing. And yes, they have a new head coach, but it's a head coach who took charge of them for five games last year, if not more, possibly six or seven. I think that makes a massive, massive difference. I like their squad profile. And I think similar to Munster two years ago, it's probably going to be the last season for Ian Henderson, for Stuart McCluskey, for John Cooney. It's a bit of a last dance vibe about this Ulster team. I really like them under the radar. But I'm going to agree with Ben. I'm going to put Connacht 10th. I just don't know if their style holds up when you take. I think their style is so dependent on having Bundy fully fit and Matt Hansen fully fit. But they're going to miss six or seven games. I don't think it holds up. Yeah. I think 10th would be... They could squeeze into the playoffs. I think they could finish lower than tenth, if I'm honest. So that's they're they're the they're, they're the ugly stepsister of this conversation, I suppose, at this stage. But they've got a shiny new stadium. It's not being built yet. Built. I, I passed by it today. It's not fully built yet. Like we're still in <laughs> construction phase. Yeah, they're staying on the same site, isn't it? They got yes, exactly. the it's just a new it's just a new stand across from where the television North cameras stand. would have been. Yeah, yeah. 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 They, they they put a post out this week saying the the stadium is not finished. It's still being built. Please stop coming to this ground and trying to get into the stadium, which, which I thought was brilliant. Right, gentlemen, we have finished our tour of Ireland. So next week we shall venture around Scotland and Italy in the newly named Scotalia uh, region. Um, we shall do all the same things again, and no doubt somebody is going to get in trouble with at least one of the Scottish sides by predicting them to not qualify quite at the top of the table. So, <laughs> will, will I just do that, Monster fan? Just go against Glasgow? Like it just makes sense. <laughs> ben, you can put Edinburgh first. I don't really. I, I'll just go against Glasgow and I make everything happy for everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> we can do um, that. On that note, gents, um, thank you very much for your time tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. Have a good week. Enjoy your rugby. All the best. Thanks, Lee. Good night,